And welcome everyone. Once again, I'm Anna Fedas, representing Stefan Battery Foundation, Active, Active Citizens Fund uh, National in Poland. And I'm uh, pleased uh, to be the host of today's meetings. Uh, like regularly, I'm coordinating bilateral and regional cooperation in our program. Uh, so uh, since we launched last week uh, the um, call for proposals on thematic projects, that's a perfect moment to uh, meet your future partner, but also uh, um, learn uh, from the experience when it comes to women's rights and advocacy uh, from um, other countries. So um, I'm very happy that we have uh, uh, today representatives from Iceland, from, from Norway, from Liechtenstein, from the Czech Republic, and also among our guests, we have, uh, apart from Polish civil society organizations, we have also uh, representatives of Romanian civil society organizations. So welcome everyone, thank you for coming. And since the agenda is very tight, so I'm not <laughs> talking anymore also uh, uh, on the program, you can find a lot of like materials on our call for proposals on the, uh, at, uh, and so when, uh, to, uh, about the program. So I'm now uh, giving the floor to our uh, first two experts from Iceland. So first I would like to um, introduce uh, Christine uh, from the ICE, I mean, so Christine, floor is yours, but actually uh, I should say screen is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much and hi to all of you. So I will <clears throat> share my screen. What I want to do is uh, <clears throat> talking a little bit about what we have done here in Iceland, mostly about methods. My colleague Brynhildur, she will, she will uh, talk uh, more about things that are, are challenging us here in, in, in Iceland. So I'd like to <clears throat> begin with reminding us of who is ruling the world. You can see in this picture, these are, are mostly men, but there are women. Sorry to interrupt them. you, Christine, but we can't see your presentation. If you could... You cannot see my presentation. Yeah, 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 yeah. It worked in our technical check, but now we can't see it. If you could share, try to share your screen again. Yes. It's always like this, like when you have rehearsal, so it works, but then... What can I... Oh, uh, the green button share screen, if you could like, try it again. Yes, wait, wait a minute. <coughs> oh, it worked so well. Um, yeah. And of course, in the meantime... Okay. Oh, sorry. Share. Yes, of course, I forgot. <laughs> I forgot that I had to do it. Of course. Well, you can use our chat to, use, to ask yeah. questions, by do the you, way. Do you see it now? Not yet, not yet. No. Well, you I have... Uh, share the screen and then choose the presentation. Yes, yeah. And it's here. So, uh, share, yes, share. Oh, now it's, it, yes. yes, we see, we can <clears throat> see it, yeah. Okay, so you heard what I said. I, I was talking about the, that uh, who is ruling the world, reminding us how the world, what, what the world looks like. There are just a few few women among those who make the decisions in, in the world. Well, 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 no, no, it doesn't work here. There are always some technical problems. Yes, it, it is, but we see the, oh yeah, we have, we see the another yes, side. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, as you may know, Iceland has topped the World Economic Forum, Forum's gender gap index for the last 11 years. And of course, we are, are proud of this. Uh, in this index, they are measuring uh, equal rights and equal opportunities in education, equal access to healthcare, as well as, as what has happened here in Iceland, that, that there has been a success in increasing the political power of, of women for the last 40 years or, or, or so. But uh, the weakest side is gender equality in the labor market. And we will maybe talk a little bit about that later. But this success is first and foremost, the work of the women's movements in this country. And the Women's Alliance, which was active from 1982 to 1999, played a crucial role in this progress. But believe me, Iceland is not a women's paradise. Uh, the methods that we have used on a, a full screen 
uh, are all kinds of actions, lobbying, and constant pressure from the women's movement and the women's strikes here in Iceland. We have managed to keep the women's movement very much alive. And what is, is special for the Icelandic women's movement is that uh, it has been, uh, there are different organizations and they have been able to, to work together on certain issues, like in the beginning, the right to vote. And nowadays it's pretty much violence against women, sexual harassment and, and uh, well, uh, equal pay and, and many other things. So, so that's something that really matters. But what is also special is, is this running, women running for elections on feminist terms. And this happened in the beginning of the 19th, of the 20th century. And again, it started in, in 1982. I'll come to that later. We, we use legislations uh, and uh, very much, and we have used quotas here in Iceland. And we have built up institutional mechanisms like the Directorate for e e Equality, the Council for Gender Equality, the Complaint Committee, and now gender equality is, is placed in the Prime Minister's office. So it's, it's central in, in, the, in the, the, the public system. And, and we also, also uh, ne negotiations on the labor market have played a role. And, and our legislation uh, on gender equality is, among other things, based on, on what's called positive duties that employers have to fulfill. And then, of course, there are international obligations like the seat of convention, the, the Beijing platform for action and, and such things that, that play an uh, important role. But as I mentioned, the women's movement in Iceland, yeah, it has worked together and it has uh, striked many times with a great, a great effect. It, and it has been repeated. This, is, this picture is from 1975. And, and in 1980, a, a woman was, was elected president in Iceland for the first time. I love to show this picture. You, it really reflects the situation as it was in Iceland in, in 1980. There is one other woman in this picture. This is the government, the parliament, the, the judges of the Supreme Court, all men. The, the women, the other women we can see, it, it's the wife of the president who was, who was leaving. And the, the strike was repeated in, in 1985 at the end of the women's decade. Again, in 2005, 2010, 2016, a very important um, protest that we were heading to, uh, towards elections, 2016, and there was not, no discussion about equal pay or anything concerning women. So it was decided to, to organize a, a big event and this was the outcome. And what it says here on, on the picture on the, on the right is don't change women, change society. And the last one was in 2018. That was Me Too and all that was going on, on then. But a little bit about the Women's Alliance, which was active from 1982 to 1999. And uh, here are a few pictures from, from uh, the, the com different campaigns. The, the there was, a, I, I can maybe tell you a little bit about it later. There's, there's the two women there, they were protesting uh, beauty contests. This is in, in the city council of, of, of Reykjavik, famous e event. Here are, are also pictures from, from the well, different groups, women running for, for parliament. And, and this here on the bottom left is, is uh, five members of, of, of uh, the Women's Alliance in, in the Icelandic Parliament. And the, the picture behind, the painting behind is from a famous meeting in, in Icelandic history in, in 1850. And of course there were no women there. So we decided to join the meeting. <laughs> and and what, is, what was important about the Women's Alliance and what is the message that I want to give to you is the, that the, the Women's Alliance is based on what was called what is called cultural feminism. Women are different from men because of their, their experience, because of, of, of uh, the, the gender roles they have they've taken on, and that 
that we should look at the, the world from women's point of view and uh, uh, create po a political statement, which was revised. In, in the first one, it was in, in 1983, then in 97, uh, in 87, 91, and 95, always developing the, this policy statement. And you know what was so important that is that this the, the women members of this movement they took time to discuss what are we going to do, how are we going to do it, why are we going to do it, trying to to look at and and create a feminist. Uh, these are feminist manifestos about what needs to be done in, in society. And here you see an example of, of the result. On the left, there is uh, the, the picture shows the development in local governments. And, and there you can see that in 82, there is a jump from 6% to 30%. And, in, and the same happened in, in the parliament. That's a picture on the right. In, in 1983, uh, you know, the number of women uh, to go up to 15% from 5 to 50. So you see how the, how the situation was. Something had to be done. And women had to do it themselves. That was one of the mottos. We, women have to change the world. No one is going to do it for us. And recently, and, the, and this, uh, the women's movement has been very much alive. Uh, there was a new movement in, in 2003, very broad feminist organization. And it, uh, it, the, the picture on, on the bottom right is, is from a protest where these, these women, they visited some, some porn clubs in, in, in Reykjavik and around, around Reykjavik and, and uh, asking men why they were going in there. They, it was known that the, there was trafficking and prostitution. On the left, we see protests from 2015, uh, what was called Free the Nipples. And, and the, the, the one on the, the bottom left is from Me, a Me, Too, Me Too protests. So these, these kinds of, of protests, these kinds of, of uh, organizing women in different kinds of actions has, has been uh, going on for, for decades making the feminist movement very visible. But what, what now? And, and uh, because I have such a short time. And what we see is that old, both old and new patriarchal monsters are rising up all over the world, threatening the rights and lives of women. These are political monsters. These are, are religious monsters and, and, and uh, and so on, different kinds of groups that are, are threatening women, among other things, using the, the modern techniques to threaten women. And what is important is that women must stay awake and protect their rights. And the question is, how can we do, do that? And I think it's, it's basic that we need more women in politics. We need feminists who support other women. And women must work together and write a feminist manifesto for the present and the future. We need to ask ourselves what, what needs to be done now, how and, and, and how and when. And as I said before, it, it takes time, but it's crucial to agree on the basic ideas, what to do, how and when. That's it's absolutely crucial. And I have been thinking a lot about this, this situation, what can we do? And, and I have been, I've been thinking about it, whether we should start a new international movement. Because there, in, in the beginning or, or around 1900, there were very strong international women's movements, like the, the, Council, of, uh, the Council of Women, which was established in, in 1888. And, there, and the, the, the Women for, for Peace and, and Freedom and other organizations. And I think, I think that this, this might be very important so we can support each other, spread ideas and, and use, uh, use all these wonderful techniques to talk to each other like we are doing here today. And we must 
from my point of view, I say that women must create new feminist models in order to change the world. And of course, women must take over. We must take over. We must become the, the majority that we are in, in, in most, most countries. But how can we do that? And so again, I, I ask, shall we start a new international women's movement? I, that's a very, very important uh, question. I, I heard that there was a, there was a meet uh, two, two uh, uh, weeks ago, about two weeks ago, about women, peace and security. And there I, I learned that, that the women in Asia who are, who are working on peace and security, they, they have created a feminist model in, in order to, uh, to approach or, or to discuss how, how to develop peace and, and security with other, other working methods. And, and I, I forgot to mention that that was one of the things that the Women's Alliance uh, did do try to uh, organize in a different ways with a flat structures, no, no chairman, uh, rotating uh, positions, both in the parliament, in the city council of Reykjavik, in, in committees, and, and trying to, to use the consensus to agree on, on decisions. And these are uh, methods that are so different from what we see in, in politics nowadays, you know, where, the, where the majority is or even so, sometimes it's the minority. Think of think of Belarus. So my message is: women get organized, learn from the past, and yeah, and and build up feminist movements. And here are you see two two pictures from uh, about what what needs to be done. All kinds of of women to break down the patriarchal. Uh, structures and built up new ones. So that's what I have to say. Thank you very much, Christine. Uh, in such a wonderful, inspiring uh, presentations. Uh, I wish to uh, listen to you more, but we have to, like, since the agenda, we I have to pass the, um, the floor and I'm honored to do so uh, to Brunhildur, our another expert from Iceland. Brunhildur. Oh, screen is yours now. So I'm like, yeah, I, I know I, uh, now you, you can share your oh, screen. Oh, fantastic. Thank you uh, so much. And thank you, Christine. It's sort of like agitate, educate, and organize. It's uh, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> that's exactly what sort of like, that's exactly yeah. what we did. And this is exactly what I'm going to be talking about. So I'm going to be picking up the thread from where Christine was and sort of like uh, uh, moving us forward to talk about the very specific solution, what we in Iceland have done once women have achieved this power, because we do have come a long way. Uh, as a, uh, again, I, I also wanted to begin by emphasizing uh, the importance, the true importance of having women in uh, positions of authority. This is a picture that I love. This is the first parliamentarian in Iceland, a woman, Ingibjörg Bjarnason, who was elected in 1920. And she was elected by a, a women's slate. She was uh, a part of the original women's parties that ran for uh, parliament because no other, uh, none of the traditional women's uh, parties would allow women to, to run for office. So she was uh, alone there for her whole uh, career. And uh, as uh, Christine was telling you, uh, for, throughout the most, uh, throughout the majority of our history as a, as a country, as, a, as an independent country, uh, men have been in the great majority of, uh, of uh, parliamentarians and, and people in a position of power. In fact, when I was born, and I'm a young woman, I was born in 1978, there were only three women in parliament, which represented 5% uh, representation and things only started changing when uh, uh, the Women's Alliance and uh, the second uh, wave feminists started agitating and actually uh, began by uh, organizing the original women's strike but because they met organizing these protests, they decided to do something constructive after the protests. It's not because in the end, it's not enough just to come out and protest. You need to do something. You need to channel it into something constructive. You need to channel it 
into getting uh, power and uh, uh, and uh, which is why I'm actually so excited and I was so heartened to see the protests that have been going on in Poland because of the mass protests, the, the citizens coming out into the street to protest injustice uh, that uh, through this, uh, that uh, that there is now an opportunity to seize the moment to actually uh, do something. That 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 there is this energy that can be channeled into uh, true and systemic change. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So this is actually our like uh, this is our like this is the the, the final sort of like uh, this was the final protest that sort of like broke our glass ceiling. Uh, this was in 2009, as Christine was telling you, Icelandic women had organized mass protests before. Uh, a protest which had uh, had driven political change, has, had driven women to be elected into positions of uh, power, but uh, uh, we never actually broke the glass ceiling in Parliament. Sort of like we ran, we were, were always sort of like uh, by the end by 2009, we had been hovering around 30 percent in Parliament for uh, 10, 15 years, and this seems to seem to be sort of like the end. People were going like, oh, 30 percent women, it's enough. Like you know, there's enough women in Parliament. We don't need any more. Then what happens, of course, uh, the uh, the financial crisis of 2008, which hit Iceland extremely hard, and uh, uh, people all over Iceland they w- went out to protest uh, the government, obviously the the banks, the whole system which had failed us, and uh, there were new elections and new people were voted into power and. Uh, and turns out, sort of like uh, uh, when you vote in new people, sort of like yeah, the, the, uh, women had a chance, and we broke the glass ceiling, and we broke it hard. Uh, we were only about thirty percent women in parliament before that, uh, before this election, and we went from thirty percent to forty-three percent. And when we look at what has changed changed in Iceland since two thousand and nine, this is just over a decade. Uh, there has been. Uh, I'm going to argue that this we have seen a a, a, a a systemic change that has happened now that women have true legislative power. Like this is a, this is what so this is a this is a picture. For example, these are the um, number of women in the Icelandic Parliament since Icelandic women got the right to vote in 2000 in, in 1915. So you see, we we usually had one woman in, in parliament. Sometimes jumped up to two, and then in the 70s we jumped up to three. And then we still slowly started climbing up after the uh, uh, after the uh, rise of the women's alliance, and sort of like in the 80s, and sort of like. But we sort of like we were hovering around 30 percent until here. We have uh, uh, the financial crisis, and we reach here is parity. We we reached that parity here. And you know we went down again in the last election. What can we do? It's, it, we're like the work isn't done. We need to we need to keep on working. But when you look at this graph, I, I like to I like to look at this graph because this shows the, these this represents a uh, hundred years of creating the legislative frame uh, by which we live. These are the people that were writing the laws which still govern the way that we live, and these laws were written by men. So it's uh, so it's a uh, it's not enough to sort of like we need so it shows sort of like this the scale of the problem and the depth of the problem that we need to rewrite the way that we uh, that our legislation and, and our society. Uh, but to see, I, I want to sort of like I. I uh, I once sat down and sort of like, and I started looking at uh, uh, the legislation that sort of like Parliament had passed that has uh, has uh, had a very direct impact on uh, 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 the status of women and women's rights. And these uh, are legislations that were passed before uh, Icelandic women broke the glass ceiling in Parliament. From 1911 to 2008, you can see here there are what eight key pieces of legislation. That's what uh, around one one key pieces of legislation per decade that uh, directly impacts and sort of like heightens the uh, 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 and uh, the status of women. So you have guaranteed to equal access to education, women's suffrage, very important, obviously, Equal Pay Act, right to abortion uh, in uh, some limited way, uh, Gender Equality Act. Gender equality only added to the constitution in 95, thanks to the Women's Alliance and the Women in Parliament, uh, uh, the Parental Leave Act, and another uh, Gender Equality Act. Now, what like, and now let's look. Let's look at what happens in a gender equal parliament when women uh, are uh, have broken the glass ceiling. Uh, these are some of the key pieces of legislation that have been passed in only the last decade. So you see, this is what happens when women have true position, that what women women have power. So you see here, 2009, pimping and the purchase of prostitution is uh, banned. That is, uh, it's it's not uh, it's not illegal to sell sex, 
it's illegal to purchase sex. We're not sort of like, uh, so, so uh, 2010 gender quotas for board of companies, 2010 employers can no longer profit from the nudity of employees. So it's sort of like strip clubs are illegal in Iceland. Uh, 2011, police are given authority to remove domestic offenders from the home. Uh, 2012, equal pay standard is introduced. 2015, law requiring government to be budget to be gender sensitive. Uh, 2018, we make the equal pay standard mandatory for all employers. Uh, 2018, rape is redefined uh, based on lack of consent. 2019, laws liberalizing abortion. Uh, this is now a, a woman's choice until the end of the 20. Uh, it's now available upon request until the end of the 22nd week. 2019 legislation uh, uh, passed to guarantee the rights of trans people, including non-binary people. And 2019 equality, equality as a whole, is passed to the prime ministry to sort of like emphasize its importance and cross-cutting importance to all areas. So these are sort of like key changes that happens happen when we have power. Like in the end, it's all about how uh, uh, that we need to get women in positions of authority where they can make real and effective change. Uh, I'm just going, because I know I have, we have very short time, I'm just going to very quickly go on uh, to talk about some of the key uh, changes that have been made that have, uh, that are effective. So sort of like what we can do, what we should be doing um, uh, with, uh, uh, with, with this power. Uh, this is something that uh, is incredibly important, sort of like that we passed uh, gender quotas in, in, uh, in government committees and actually also now in boards of companies. Uh, we, uh, it's uh, uh, because we recognize that there is, uh, that we need to have women in these, uh, in these areas in positions of authority. So we have passed law, laws mandating that uh, women should be on boards of, uh, of, of government committees and on, on, uh, in companies. And this is also makes financial sense as well, because studies have shown, for example, that uh, companies that have had more equal represent, like more women or more balanced boards in terms of uh, gender, uh, they were more likely to actually survive the financial crisis than other boards. So it makes a uh, great financial sense. Uh, yeah, this is the corporate uh, laws. Uh, we have passed uh, laws that uh, require companies uh, and institutions with 25 or more employees to have gender action plans. What this means is that uh, uh, like employers need to have sort of like, to, they need to think about how they are going to ensure that their employees uh, 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 shall be equal, like how everyone, uh, women and men uh, or people who are uh, non-binary, how they can sort of like uh, take care of their families and sort of like integrate home and life and sort of like and also a side effect of this, this means that uh, a, a company also needs to hire somebody that has a knowledge to create a gender action plan. So they, this, this means that companies need to hire feminists and people that have a, a gender uh, studies education so to, that have the expertise to make these plans and carry them out. Uh, equal pay standard is uh, incredibly important, and if anyone has questions about it, I'm not going to talk quickly about it. It's, it's basically what it means is that in all other countries in the world, uh, we, uh, all countries have some sort of law in place that bans pay discrimination. So like it is illegal in all countries to ban, to discriminate on basis of gender in terms of uh, pay. However, Iceland is now the only country that uh, requires companies to prove that they are not breaking the law. In all other countries, it's up to the individual employee to prove that they are being discriminated against and seek uh, justice. In Iceland, from since 2018, all companies with uh, 25 or more employees or all employers, they need to, to uh, achieve what we call uh, equal pay certification to prove that they are not discriminating against anyone in uh, their employee. So this is a, a radical change and this is uh, something that uh, we are very hopeful about and this is something that can be easily transferred to other countries but of course with the caveat that there is a political will which of course goes to the root of the problem as Christian was talking about we cannot make these changes just if politics first we need to run for office um, all right equal pay equal pay uh, so here you can see the labor participation in Iceland. You see that women uh, uh, women actually have had a very high uh, uh, labor participation in Iceland since 1981. And for the past uh, 20, 30 years, uh, 20 years, it's been uh, almost equal. 
uh, it's, it's really equal. It's uh, like a, a 79% versus 83%. Like there is very little difference. And so you can see the changes and what's going on here. And this is the key, sort of like these are the legislations that made this possible. So you see the jump from 1960 to 1981. What has happened here in between is that we have the first legislation that allows for uh, maternity leave. Uh, sort of like without maternity leave, sort of like women are, 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 have find it very hard to enter the labor market. So with maternity leave, you see women going into the labor force in a great, uh, great, great um, uh, numbers. And what the changes that happens between 80 and 2001, what happens here is that you start to see the uh, uh, guaranteed universal access to daycare. And as soon as daycare, universal access to gay, daycare is guaranteed, you see women going into the labor market and not leaving again. And this uh, is absolute key and sort of like, uh, aside from women in politics, you need to guarantee uh, the economic liberty and freedom of women by providing these key changes. So, uh, so if there are two issues that sort of like women in power or people in power need to agitate for to sort of like make these changes uh, sustainable is to guarantee uh, maternity and uh, paternity leave and to guarantee daycare because like without women making their own money, uh, true change is hard to achieve. Uh, yeah, so you see here, like it's a uh, universal, you see children in a daycare from the ages of two, it's 96%. Uh, the children that are not in daycare is usually due to health reasons. And even before the age of two, sort of like the great majority of uh, children, is, uh, uh, the, it's rising numbers of uh, children that are going into daycare from the age of one. Uh, we now have uh, four months uh, in uh, paternity and maternity leave. Four months are tied to each parent in uh, parental leave. Two months is uh, to share. Uh, there is now before parliament a bill that's going to be increasing this leave uh, to uh, 12 months. So, um, uh, and yeah, and you can see the paternity leave in Iceland, uh, it's uh, uh, incredibly popular. These are the sort of like the figures, fathers taking paternity leave as percentage of mothers. It's, uh, it's uh, from the very beginning, it's hovered around uh, 80 to 90% and it uh, goes up and down in a seasonal way. Um, again, but as I, uh, again, I want to finish by, <laughs> I want to finish by talking, uh, like Krishna to say, we are not a gender equal paradise. We're not a women's paradise. We, 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 we have come far in, cre in, in, in guaranteeing gender equality, but we have still have a, a long way to go. So this is sort of like the, for example, even with all the uh, policies that we've put into place, these are these are the the the, the different uh, figures how we can um, calculate the uh, gender income inequality in Iceland. So you see this middle part. This is the unadjusted gender pay gap in Iceland. This basically means sort of like this is a gender pay gap calculated on an hourly basis. And here, like with 3.6%, 3, 3 this is what the statistician calls uh, call the unexplained gender pay gap, and this uh, per hour. And this is when they calculate, oh, you know, you see, we can actually explain this gender pay gap by, by, by saying that sort of like uh, this person is working in uh, the health industry and this person is working in the construction industry and the health industry obviously has less money than the the construction industry so that's why uh, we explain this and they but the end and, and so they explain away all the differences in the the gender pay gap but obviously we we disagree with that uh, analysis that sort of like there is a uh, that that we we say that this difference is obviously based on gender sort of like that there are uh, certain sectors of uh, uh, of the uh, labor market that are, are, are lower paid than uh, the cert than other sectors, and those sectors are primarily uh, female dominated. And of course, these, this large figure here, 26%, this is the number that we want to focus on as the true number. And this is the total gender earnings gap. And this is sort of like the earnings gap based, uh, uh, calculated on a monthly basis. Like, because this reflects the fact that even if we have a high labor force participation of women, women tend to work shorter, a shorter work week. They work 35 hours a week and men work around 42, 43 hours a week. Why? It's not that women are lazy and they don't want to work. It's because they're doing unpaid labor in the household. They're actually the ones that are taking time off to take care of their families, impacting not only their wages today, but also their, their future earnings, their, uh, the rise in, uh, in their profession and, uh, uh, and their, um, and their uh, pensions in the future. So uh, this is uh, the, these are the inequalities that we need to to address with uh, with that. Uh, but of course, as Christine said, 
the key to that is to get uh, people, uh, women in positions of authority in the legislation, uh, in companies, to actually create a system that works for all of us, not for just some of us. So as we can see, uh, yeah, sure, Iceland is uh, in the top of the global gender in gap index. We've been for 11, 12 years. Uh, but it says here, like, we have re reached 87.7% uh, uh, equality. And you know what? 87.7%, that's not equality. That's still inequality. So we still have a long way to go. So we need to work together as a feminist movement, not only in Iceland, but together with our uh, neighbors in, in Europe to create a true a systemic international change. And that's how we change the world. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Like it was so inspiring, Bruchildur. And if you could, uh, Christian Bruchildur, go through chat because we have, there are a lot of questions to you about dream gaps, about uh, like um, uh, women with disabilities in power. So uh, please, if you could uh, uh, go through chat. So we had uh, Bren Hildur from Icelandic Women's Rights Association and Christine from Ice Feminine. And now, as um, like um, Bren Hildur showed on the slide, Right up be, uh, below Iceland, we have Norway as the country of the most successful gender uh, gap. So, um, so now I would like to invite uh, Toril Hochstadt uh, from the uh, municipality of uh, Christian Sand. Uh, she's an advisor for equality, diversity, and social inclusion. So, um, um, Tor uh, Toril, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you to Iceland for a very interesting presentation. I can see that Iceland and Norway have a lot in common when it comes to uh, equality and gender equality. So it was very interesting to listen to that. Uh, I am a, a bureaucrat and working for the municipality, Kristiansand municipality, as a coordinator for the, the municipality's work for equality, inclusion and diversity. Um, I'm going to try to share the screen with you. Um, uh, see all my... <laughs> it works, um, works perfectly, yeah. <laughs> Good, thank you. Uh, Kristiansand is, uh, uh, to be a Norwegian city, is quite a big city with, with 115,000 inhabitants, but we are uh, situated all on the south, southern part of the country in a region which is quite traditional, uh, traditional and conservative. So uh, in, when we compare to other Norwegian cities, we have uh, bigger uh, um, uh, challenges when it comes to uh, to equality, um, and to cope uh, with these challenges, we are collaborating uh, with civil society organizations. That's very important to get re good results. So that's uh, what I'm going to try and inform you about. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, as uh, municipalities, uh, most of municipalities and bureaucratic organizations, we have uh, adopted a strategy about uh, equality, inclusion, and uh, diversity, which is uh, called It's All About People. Uh, the strategy was adopted by the City Council in 2015, and it's a uh, basic for the work we are doing. The strategy states that for Christian Sam, Equality implies that everyone, regardless not only of gender, but also of ethnicity, religion or belief, functional ability, um, sexual orientation, gender expression or gender identity, has the opportunity for, for community participation on equal terms. So this is important both for benefiting in full from this, the resources in the community, and with regard to justice. So this document is important for the lives of our citizens, uh, for the uses of municipal services and for our employees. Um, in Kristiansand municipality, uh, as an employer, 
Uh, and generally in all Norwegian municipalities, we have a lot of women working. 75% of the staff are women. And this is due to the municipality's responsibility for the services for elderly people, for kindergartens and primary schools, where 80 to 95% of the staff are women. And uh, uh, this is something we are working uh, together with, uh, with uh, the organizations to, to uh, make better and to get, for instance, more men into elderly, elderly care. Um, well, uh, so we are collaborating with the unions and uh, mostly most of the staff are organized in one of the unions uh, of the municipality. And uh, some of the union leaders are redeemed so they can take part in the processes and uh, meetings with the municipality. So they take part in the development of the municipality. So, and there is a common understanding then that when even if the employer and the employees can have different interests, it's uh, you get the better re results by coordinating because we have uh, by collaborating because we have common goals. So this also implies, of course, the work for gender equality and the equality for all the other suppressed or discriminated groups in the municipality. Um, so this is uh, uh, Kristiansand and B for Alle. Kristiansand, a city for everyone. This is a, a week to uh, make known for everyone that uh, we have a strategy which, uh, which uh, states that uh, Kristiansand is going to, has to be a city for everyone, which is good to live in for everyone. Um, it's a... Uh, so we, um, sorry, <laughs> uh, to succeed to be a city for everyone, we are very, very, uh, we need to collaborate with civil society organizations. And uh, in Norway, a large amount of the citizens are organized in, in the volunteer organizations. So to make approved the equality objectives known for everyone in concert, it was decided to arrange an annual week for this purpose called Christian Sanna City for Everyone, one week in February. And this started in 2018. Uh, the week should have full focus on equality, inclusion and diversity with activities dealing with these topics arranged all over the city. To make the strategy widely known, it's important to get all the citizens involved. The uh, activities during the weeks are arranged by NGOs, community-based organizations, and other volunteer organizations, private businesses, and public institutions. Uh, for example, uh, feminist organizations, organizations dealing with immigrants, religious organizations, sports, art, and institutions like libraries, theater, kindergartens. The municipal organization provides meeting facilities, marketing and advice or assistance. And the organizations take care of the arrangements and the activities. So this is a collaboration to get a good result. The first time the week was arranged in 2018, it was a great success. About 40 different organizers arranged more than 60 different activities. And this year in February, the week involved even more organizers and arrangements. And we are now planning the fourth week in February, 2021. Of course, with the necessary Corona restrictions. Uh, finally, I'll give a couple of examples of arrangements during the week. The Norwegian Polish organization Razim Alik Salmon arranged a sofa for all in a shopping center in Kristiansand. Here people can sit down, they can have a coffee and a piece of cake and ask questions about Poland and whatever they are curious to know. And this was a success. Many people visited their sofa and had an interesting chat. 
at the theater, <clears throat> Uh, there was arranged a stand-up performance of, uh, about women's lives and challenges. So, to succeed in becoming a city which is good for everyone, Kristiansand municipality is totally dependent on a collaboration with the civil society organizations. Most of the volunteer organizations in the city and the municipal organization agree on the objective to be an inclusive city with regards to diversity as, which regards the diversity as a resource. The municipal organization cannot do this alone. So as you understand, um, in Kristiansand, we think that gender equality is the most important topic, but, uh, gender equality has very much in common with uh, equality for other suppressed groups and uh, we are now working to see the, the common uh, challenges and try to solve them uh, in cooperation with the civil society organizations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tori. Like um, you can see how it is like when you have like a women um, uh, in uh, as a, like advisors, decision makers, and, and in the municipalities. So uh, it's wonderful. I would love to um, like uh, live in the city with such strategies and and uh, like taking care of the like vulnerable groups. So thank you very much. And we have another example from Norway and another good practices, golden practices. So now I would like to give the floor to Elisabeth uh, Heldberg uh, from the Legal Aid for Women called JUR. Or I, yeah, I mispronounce it. Yeah. So floor is yours. Oh, uh, like a wonderful team. <laughs> so we can, okay. Yes. So screen thank is you. yours. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> And I of course, use the past to ask questions. I felt it was a contrast to the hug. Let's see. Let's mute Toril Hogstad. I thought I had done that. I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, just a moment. Yeah, we see the presentation. It's not just a full screen, but we don't. It's not a problem, of course. Okay. Okay. Let's see now. Do you see it now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we see it. It's perfect. Here. Yeah, thank yes. you. Hello, everyone. We are so grateful to be here and we're already feeling very inspired by hearing from Iceland and the wonderful presentations so far. So thank you for the invitation to be here. We will share our experiences and strategies to work for advocating for gender equality in Norway. We are caseworkers in Jürk in Oslo, and my name is Elisabeth Hölberg, and with me is Hanna Benson Eibe. So, about legal advice for women or Jürk. Jürk was founded in 1974 by law students and law professors um, as a result of the rise of feminism. From the start, Jürk has had three foundations which are still the core of our organization. First, first is it, uh, it is to give rights information, to provide women information about their legal rights and duties. This was based on the suspicion that women on a general basis had less knowledge about their rights than men. And this suspicion proved to be correct. By providing legal information and help to self-help, we aim to empower women so they themselves can demand their rights. We also provide free legal aid by representing women in conflict resolution mechanisms or writing complaints to public authorities like the Directorate for Immigration to strengthen women's access to justice. And uh, what we will mostly focus on today, advocacy to change the existing laws and norms. Through our casework, we get a unique insight in women's legal situation today, which allows us to identify problematic legal areas. And this provides a basis for our legal advocacy work. And some more on advocacy. We were asked to talk about our experience when it comes to activities such as advocacy and lobbying on women's rights. And since Jurik is an organization that gives legal counseling, our main focus is to advocate for changes in Norway's legislation. 
and we try to advocate through many different channels. We often advocate directly to the policymakers and the politicians from almost all of the Norwegian political parties. We aim to share our knowledge and influence our politicians by attending both oral and written hearings and by organizing private meetings with the politicians. Sometimes we are also invited to hold lectures on specific topics for a political party. And whenever the content of a new regulation or law is being developed, UIC aims to investigate what the effect of the law or regulation will be from an intersectional gender equality perspective. And when possible, we try to participate at an early stage of the development of a new law. Jörg also advocates for gender equality by being an active participant in the general public debates. We organize and, and attend debates and panel discussions, hold social media campaigns with a focus on awareness, and write articles for both local and national media. We cooperate with other women's organizations or even public bodies with a particular function. The Norwegian Ombud for Equality and Anti Discrimination. When it comes to advocacy strategies, UN finds that a good starting point is to use the international obligations arising from international conventions and treaties that your country has ratified. This can, for example, be the CEDA Convention or the Istanbul Convention to End Violence Against Women. If your country has committed to respect, protect, and fulfill specific international obligations, this can, at least in Norway, be used as leverage when advocating and lobbying before our governments. An important work, part of UDIC's advocacy work is to do our own research. For example, UDIC has done multiple surveys on women's situation in Norwegian prisons, especially the women's prisons. We use our findings as the basis for advocating for improving the conditions in women's prisons and to show that the conditions in the women's prisons do not fulfill the international standards. Furthermore, we build our advocacy work on the experience and knowledge that has been accumulated through decades providing legal counseling and aid to women. And we are able to track tendencies and provide concrete examples that show how the legal framework affects women's everyday life and how certain laws and regulation have an indirectly discrimination, discriminating effect. And we find that when we base our advocacy on experience, this gives our advocacy work invaluable substance. UDIC aims to balance the role as an expert and the role as an activist. And we find that the more fact and experience based our argumentation is, the easier it is to be heard by both the general public and by public authorities or at least it makes it harder to discredit or ignore our contribution and arguments. UDIC's experience is that it usually takes many years to get legislation changes that we believe are necessary to enhance gender equality. Despite this, it is important to continue to advocate for the necessary changes and to try and keep the subject relevant. Sometimes the political climate or the public's perception can suddenly shift to our advantage. And when this happens, we need to act fast and prioritize the organization's capacity towards making the change happen. And there are a few challenges when I'm advocating for women's rights in Norway. And the problem we most often face today is the belief that women in Norway are already equal with men. This is largely because Norway, as we have already seen, uh, is ranked as one of the most gender, gender equal countries in the world. There is a perception and also a rhetoric actively used by radical right wing parties that the only gender equality problems we have are regarding fem female genital mutilation or negative social control, and that this only exists in certain immigrant uh, communities. Of course, this is not true. We, Norway struggles with violence against women, especially domestic violence, intimate partner, partner homicide, and an extremely low conviction rate for rape. Women are still being paid less than men, like in Iceland. And we see women, women and young girls being subjected to sexual harassment, discrimination during and after a woman's pregnancy at the workplace. And I could go on. Today, Almost all of the Norwegian laws are gender neutral. Many therefore think that women are equal with men before the law. 
However, what Yulk sees in our casework is that laws often affect women differently and that they therefore have an indirectly discriminatory effect. This is, for example, the case with Norway's legislation on, co on cohabitation. In Norway, women and men are, are allowed to live together before they are married. This is also very common, especially among young couples, and many people never marry. However, as opposed to the rules regarding what happens when a married couple gets divorced, there's no legislation regulating what happens when cohabitants, who may have been together for 30 years and have children together, break up. As a result, women who have spent more time doing house chores and less time doing paid work often come poorly out in the case of a breakup. Yurik sees it as our mission and duty to share our knowledge on these indirectly discriminatory effects of either an existing law or the absence of, regul of regulation in an area of society. Often, the problem is simply that the lawmakers and parliament did not consider these types of effects of the law when the law was made. To make politicians recognize that this is a problem, we arrange meetings with all political parties where we discuss the topic, we write newspaper articles and so forth to create awareness. And lastly, some about international cooperation. The way we see it, there are at least two strong reasons for transnational cooperation uh, among civil society organizations. The first is exchanging experience both regarding advocacy strategies and uh, of concrete content of gender policies. It gives opportunity to strengthen and discover new effective ways of lobbying for change. Yurik and the Norwegian Women Lobby have, for example, learned a lot from the Swedish Women's Lobby's experience in advocating for a change in the Swedish panel code. A strong transnational partnership between women's organizations will make it easier to share information research reports and arguments for why policy reforms are necessary in specific areas. Transnational partnership can also help to empower the national women's organizations to continue their fight for equality. The second is that it allows us to keep up to date on women's rights status in other countries. We believe that it is important to have a strong international feminist community where feminists organizations support and contribute the way they can in struggles women face in other countries. This also allows organizations to put pressure on national politicians so they can work politically to ensure women access to justice also outside of Norway. Pressure from an international movement can also have an impact on national decision making. Lastly, transnational feminist cooperation is also important to put pressure on international bodies like the UN for developing and adopting gender sensitive and anti discrimination treaties and conventions. So this is what we have now, but feel free to ask us questions in the chat. We have several more examples on um, present advocacy and so on. Thank you for Thank you. <laughs> That was like a uh, uh, really like wonderful to, uh, to see your approach to advocacy and uh, to see how uh, advocacy can help uh, uh, achieving more equal um, society. Thank you very much. So we are now moving from Norway to Liechtenstein, our uh, third donor state, um, 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 uh, donor state, and we are very pleased and happy to host uh, uh, three representatives of um, of organizations from Liechtenstein. So we have Petra Eichhelle, Andrea Matt, and Eva Maria Schoidle. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. And I would like to give the floor to uh, representatives of Liechtenstein. And please use our chat. I'm very honored that we uh, um, have su such an interesting debate on our chat uh, mutually to, while uh, listening to presentations. So. Let's move to Liechtenstein. Well, uh, thank you very much for inviting us. Um, we are very pleased to be uh, here with you. And uh, my name is Petra Eichele, and I am representing the INFRA, the Information and Counseling Center for Women in Liechtenstein. And I am also representing the Le Women's Network of Liechtenstein. With me are today my colleagues Eva Maria Schädler and Andrea Matt, and they will take over after me. 
uh, to understand our women's rights movement in Liechtenstein, uh, we have to give you some information about Liechtenstein and I'll also look a little bit uh, to the history because um, uh, the Principality of Liechtenstein is very small, as you can see. Uh, we are located in the center, center of Europe and bordering Switzerland and Austria. Our total area is only 160 square kilometers and our population is about 39,000 people. So we are a very, very small country. Uh, we have, uh, Liechtenstein offers uh, 40,000 uh, workplaces. Uh, this is very special. Uh, more than we have inhabitants and uh, half of them, uh, half of them employees uh, come from the borders from Liechtenstein and Austria. This is uh, very special, I think. Um, what you also have to know is uh, that Liechtenstein is a constitutional hereditary monarchy on a democratic and parliamentary basis. Also the power of the state is shared between the prince and the people. And uh, the principality is based on a constitution from 1921. You have to know that Liechtenstein is very traditional. Uh, the, we, the state religion is Catholic and religion still plays an important part in our life. Uh, this reflects uh, also decision-making in politics and reflects also our society. Uh, the next folie, please. Uh, our political landscape, uh, you see our government, it has five members and we are proud, at least we have two women in the government. But when we look at our parliament, uh, it looks different. Only three out of 25 seats are taken by women in the national parliament. Uh, most women in Liechtenstein are very well educated and also follow a career, but at the same time, the political representation is very poorly. Since uh, 2013, the percentage of women on the national level has been declining from 20 to 13 percent. At the last parliamentary election in 2017, as I said, only three out of 25 seats uh, went to women. The election in 2017 was a real setback for us, uh, but it led uh, to some new initiatives and Eva Maria will uh, present you one of them later. Uh, the next parliamentary election is in February and we hope really for a change then. Um, I'm coming to uh, the development of our uh, women's rights. And as you see, the pictures are from 1971, and it says in German, uh, which means shame on you. Uh, since we are a very conservative and still traditional country, our milestones of uh, women's right history go not back so far. As you see in 1984, and it's 1984, we finally got uh, our rights to vote passive and actively. And it took three rounds of votes in 1971, in 1973, and finally in 1984, uh, uh, it, uh, we finally got the right to vote. And uh, you have to remember, it was all male that voted. So we took three rounds. The next milestone was in 1992. Uh, 
Article 30, 31 of the Constitution was uh, amended as follows. All nationals are equal before the law. Public offices shall be equally as accessible to men and women. And this law was established in 1993. In 1995, uh, our government uh, ratified the CEDO, which was very important for us. And uh, four years later, uh, we got a law against discrimination at work. The law refers to the workplace and uh, forbids discrimination based on the sex, like our Iceland colleagues also um, said already. Uh, this and last year, and I represent you also the counseling center, uh, I noticed an increase on consultation about sexual harassment at the workplace. And I think that finally, uh, the Me Too debate has also reached Liechtenstein, uh, two or three years later than other countries. But uh, unfortunately, had until today no legal care about sexual harassment uh, at the court. All uh, cases were settled before they went to court. And uh, the reason I believe lies in the small size of our country you have to know everybody knows everybody. And uh, women are very hesitant and cautious about taking their employees to court. So this uh, uh, look back uh, to our history and I'm now changing my hat and uh, uh, represent uh, the Women's Network of Liechtenstein. Uh, our network is an umbrella organization with 12 uh, member NGOs. And since 1997, uh, women's organizations meet for exchange and for networking. And we also work together on various projects. Uh, the women's network also contributes in the law legislation process by writing statements. Uh, in 2016, we re-established the Women's Network and gave us a legal framework. Since we had to take over various duties from our National Equality Office. Uh, the Equality Office was established after the introduction of the Equality Act in 1996. And un unfortunately, uh, in 2011, an administrative reform by the government took place and our equality office was reduced to an organizational unit in the Department of Social Affairs, which means uh, fewer financial resources and less women power. Uh, the main focus of the women's network lies in public statements and the interference and contribution in the law legislation process. We might make sure uh, the legislative, leg, legislative takes uh, women's view and women's living condition into consideration when law amendments or new laws are implemented. We publish on a regular basis comments and articles in our local newspapers, uh, topics like representation of men, men and women, equal pay and pension gap. We also take an active part at the CEDO process. Uh, we wrote in 2016 a shadow report regarding the CEDO, CEDO country report of Liechtenstein. I think Eva Maria will also talk about this later. And uh, our latest project, uh, we started last year and also Eva Maria will uh, explain to you that new project. And uh, I'm changing now my hat and I uh, represent you uh, our work at INFRA. Uh, I'm, re I'm really working on the basis. Uh, I'm working with women. Our organization uh, was founded in 1986 
and next year we celebrate 35 years. And um, we are the only contact point and information center for women in Liechtenstein. And last year uh, we provided individual advice and legal advice in about 600 cases. Almost half of our advice is in the field of divorce, separation and financial support. Half of the women uh, who seek advice in our office are migrant women who often do not speak German. And for those women, we pro provide uh, translation services. We work also together with other NGOs and we are also part at, uh, of the Women's Network and uh, we are active in the political and social field. Two thirds of our budget comes from the government, uh, from the social department, and one third we have to raise by fundraising, which is quite a challenge. Um, these, are, these are our key messages. As a, I strongly believe uh, in empowerment through information, and my colleagues from Norway uh, said uh, the same. Uh, we support uh, women in their current life situation. Uh, we believe, uh, or we try to support them and strengthen them so they can act for themselves. But we also engage uh, for equal opportunities for women and men, but we keep the focus on women's rights. But, uh, for example, in the field of uh, work-life balance, we also work together with a main organization. And uh, we take part in the le legislation process and lobby with other NGOs. And we currently keep an eye on the legislation process regarding pension plan and a revision on social security. And I come uh, to our counseling and uh, to our projects. So you see uh, the field, fields of activities at our center. Uh, as I said before, we believe in empowerment through information. And uh, we offer advice and also free legal advice uh, through us and also through our female lawyers. Uh, one big part is information uh, about the marriage law. Uh, we inform about rights and duties during marriage. A big part uh, of the question and information are about finances. And we try to inform women or sensibilize uh, women uh, how to take care on their financial situation, especially when they reduce their uh, workload and uh, take over unpaid care work. Uh, I mean, we all know that this leaves uh, a gap in the pension. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And we also give information about uh, work-life balance, as I said before, unpaid care work, about labor law, uh, we inform about maternity leave and the protection against dismissal, we inform about financial benefits and so on. In the field of integration, we give information about the legal aspects of the right of residence and uh, very important in Liechtenstein, the effect of a divorce and possible loss of the residence permit. Uh, we try to raise awareness to financial issues like the effects on the women's pension when reducing work. We offer coaching and also for big ne negotiations. Uh, we publish several publications, we have several publications uh, on mobbing and stalking. And we have a guidebook on divorce, uh, even lawyers in Liechtenstein and our judges at the family court work with our guidebook. So uh, 
this is the empowerment if infra offers women in Liechtenstein. Thank you. And I give the floor to Eva Maria Scheller. Thank you very much. Um, I'm pleased to inform you about two current projects that we have started very recently in Liechtenstein. Um, and one is the, uh, the archive on the women's rights movement of civil society called the Frauenarchiv. Um, and the, it's now it started in 2018, very recently, though we're still collecting a lot of material. And our in in our intention is to collect the information, to collect the material as we experience that some of the women that have been very active in the former uh, in political activities also that were involved in fighting for the women's rights for vote um, are, are coming to a certain age and are in danger to throw away the material very simply. And there is no official um, uh, office that is somehow interested in that, this material. So we saw the need to collect this material. Uh, and we also see that there is a big interest in this project um, we are now in the second phase of the project after we're still collecting and archiving the material. We're building up a digital archive, a catalog that can be searched through. Um, and on the same time, we uh, want to focus on mediation of this material. So that will be also in the area of education to work together with schools uh, that will work together to, to remember and also celebrate uh, which is also a very important issue, I think. We need to celebrate our success and our developments uh, in order not to forget about it. And also to raise interest of uh, younger women and boys in the story of the women's rights movement and to raise awareness that we are by far not at the end. Uh, another focus area is research. That we want to build a basis for researcher to find the material um, and to uh, promote research on women's rights movement in Liechtenstein. Then another project that started uh, recently is, um, is a project to raise political representation of women in politics. Um, it is an eight year project um, that is under the umbrella uh, of the women's network. Uh, we are financed by the biggest part by um, foundations. Um, we have some financing also from the government. And um, we have three focus areas here. One is political education and training, um, then empowerment, which is broadly also um, covering activities like supporting women that are running for elections, and then the election process as such. And, and there, as one of uh, recent activity that we had is uh, that we try to work together with parties, and I say try, it's not always that easy, um, with the parties to uh, have a better look at the recruitment process that we think is one of the major issues in the election process. Um, uh, in Liechtenstein, it's always said that it's very hard to find women for to running for, for elections, um, that they, that the men you have to ask twice and he will say yes, and for women you have to ask them five and then they will say no. Um, yes, but you have to ask them why they are not running because uh, still the uh, care, care load at home is mainly on a women's head. So these are topics that we need to make parties that are looking for women to run for elections, they need to be aware of. And then, um, that, but that's, um, it's, it's very hard work, I have to say. <laughs> no, but we are at the beginning and I hope that we'll, we will can support now the, the upcoming uh, elections uh, in 2020 for the parliament, uh, 21, sorry, for the parliament uh, and we'll, make a change in, in this election to raise our quota of female parliamentary in the parliament. Um, yes, I keep it very short. I will pass the floor now to my colleague, Andrea Mott, uh, who is 
currently who is running for the parliament. We're very happy and we are wishing you cool. all the best and we will try to support you on all levels. Congratulations, that's wonderful. Yes, yeah, so fa thanks Eva Maria and Petra for all you have said and told about Liechtenstein. It makes easy, it easy for me to focus on another topic. I'm, I'm a woman who has been born without the right to vote. When I were 20 and became adult, I couldn't vote. So it took me until I was 38 to be able to vote the first time. And it changed my life to, to know that we have to fight for our rights. And uh, I've... Uh, I was, uh, I went for an election for several times first in uh, the village I live and in 2005 for the parliament and I became a member of parliament and was four years in parliament. In those time I started to study law and I had uh, a one year training in women's law. Uh, now, two, four years later, we lost election, and now I am back again trying to come into the parliament a second time. Um, as a profession, I'm a coach. I focus on women, and it's my aim to empower and strengthen women so they fight for their life in not only in political topics but also uh, to have the right to work and you see we are working together in Liechtenstein we are such a small country we don't have so many women so we are uh, it's a need to work together and we do a lot for example you see on the picture that uh, are friends of mine who visit the nations, United Nations. Uh, this button, Quotenfrau, you see on the left bottom, I have the same button at, ho at home. It was an initiative who uh, is working that half of the women in all commissions and government and parliament should be women. And they have gone for an initiative and the success they reach. We don't have now uh, a law that helps us, but they were, they did campaigning and with their campaigning, they changed a little bit. The campaigning made, uh, builds up the awareness of a problem and I see it as a success that when we had two years ago the election for the governments in the villages, more women reached to be in those, it's not a parliament, we call it Gemeinderat, I don't know the meaning in English, pardon me, uh, but more women now work in the villages, in the, not in the, in the ex executive work they do it. And hopefully what they did will help us now to have more women in the new parliament in next year. There is the women's strike days and other things, but Eva, do you, would you go further? Because my point of view is when I am a politician, I need the other organization because campaigning and building up the awareness is what I need to be able in parliament to change things. You see, we had stalking, an initiative we did in 2007. And in 2006, uh, which I discussed with Infra, with the Women's House, with the women that we should make, we all decided we make 2007 the year of stalking in Liechtenstein. And we focus on that topic. 
and we arranged everything. I, with a lawyer, I built up the initiative for the parliament. The other women did other actions. And starting in February, we put that actions on the floor. And you see on the left lower, you see uh, Gabi from Infra and Anya from with Women's House. They opened the year of stalking. And there are, you see me in the middle on the top, a little bit younger than I'm now, and our friends of mine who supported all, we worked together and within half a year, we had a law that protects women now from stalking. And that's the force, the combination of campaigning, doing strikes, going on the street, and the politician who can drop in that window of change that opens through the campaigning, we can put in an initiative and say in the parliament, we need that. And due to the campaigning, the men in the parliament, they don't uh, dare to say no. They simply say yes, due to the campaigning. So the, the, the success does not only come from the politicians, it comes also from all the organization that support us politician to, to do the change. And we, had, we were lucky with the stalking. We had one year and we had the law. For other things, we have been working for years and years, for example, for better child care. Uh, I know uh, when I, uh, in 1992, we had the first uh, um, how do you, child care possibility in Liechtenstein, and now we have it in every village. Parental leave was a no-go in 2005, and it will be installed hopefully next year. Uh, what is very important for me is to have women as a role model. For example, I have been, uh, I have been, I have done a lot of elections, but I have only been elected twice. So, but to go in the election process already changes something because women get visible. And that is, uh, that is campaigning at its best for, for to be a politician. You need several elections to be as well known as a man is in his first election. That is a discrimination we are going through as politicians. And I think all of you know how hard that is, but you have to lose several election to win in the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, um, uh, and good luck, of course, and fingers <laughs> crossed. And we hope that next time we are meeting, uh, we will host you as a um, yeah, parliamentarist. So thank you very much. Like amazing inspiration from Liechtenstein. I have to admit, I um, haven't known so much about your country. And uh, like, I'm amazed how much you achieved in short, such a short period of time, like uh, looking at the 1984 when you got the uh, right to vote in that's right really that's really impressing like we can we can learn a lot from you so thank you very much uh, and now we are moving to czech republic our neighbor country and we are really on like honored uh, to host also like beneficiary states not only donor yeah. states representatives but also beneficiary state when it comes to active citizens found and now i would like to uh, invite and give the floor to hannah as Belzerova, director of Czech Women's Lobby, a member of the European Women's Lobby. Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yes, we, we can see the presentation. Not my presenter, but, but not... Not the full screen mode, but... Try to manage. Uh -huh, okay. Okay, there we go. Yeah, it Thank is. you very much for inviting me. 
uh, it's very inspiring to be here and, and a lot of things have been already said and I can see, oh, my, my presentation is going by itself. I don't know how to stop that. <laughs> I'll try to manage, sorry. Um, uh, so many interesting things already being said and uh, I can see the differences and also the similarities between our countries and my presentation is aiming on introduction our uh, Czech Women's Lobby which is an association of organizations uh, but I'd like to add a comment about our history because uh, uh, when, I, when I hear uh, the differences uh, around the Europe and how women's movement uh, must be part of it, uh, how it's important to be united. We were quite lucky in the Czech Republic because when our country started in 1918, we got uh, a feminist president, Tomáš Karik Masaryk, and he actually uh, helped us with all the main laws. So we were one of the first countries be able to vote for uh, voting, uh, women were able to go and vote. And also women started to go to university, education could uh, start to share jobs, even though it was a hard time. And we mustn't forget that uh, it was mainly women and women's movement who was strong at the time too, who actually uh, brought these laws uh, and uh, who was lobbying for it. So it doesn't happen by itself. We need supporters, but it's our work as, as our um, colleagues said before me. Uh, who, what, what, I like to introduce Czech Women's Lobby that I'm um, director of. We are an umbrella organization uh, promoting women's rights in the Czech Republic and we are established in 2008. Um, we were established uh, as a um, as an initiative of European Women's Lobby, who is addressing each country and actually wants to participate with network within that country. So that was the first impulse for Czech Women's Lobby to, uh, be, uh, to be established. And also that's why we've got the name Czech Women's Lobby, which is not very popular when you do advocacy work, but uh, we still keep in it and, and uh, promoting our work with this strong name. We already have uh, 37 organizations and uh, we together are working on different issues that I will introduce later. And I must say that uh, it's very important for uh, this diverse group of people and women uh, to um, collaborate our, our, our values, our feminist values, our uh, statements. So we discuss all uh, these issues before we actually uh, establish some value or some a statement of the network and recently we had a discussion on women and climate and now we can lobby for this issue because we already have a set statement on this issue and now we will be proactive in this uh, important issue because uh, there is a lack of gender um, view on uh, climate uh, changes uh, in the world and we would like to be active in this issue even uh, in uh, Europe but uh, also in the Czech Republic. Uh, who we are right now uh, we unite 37 organizations but we it changes every every year uh, depends who is coming uh, and also sometimes leaving uh, it's uh, really based on a proactive activity of, of our members so uh, we advocate laws and ensure better life for women and uh, we focus on those um, uh, women who are actually represented in our members organizations. We promote equality between men and women, strengthen the position of uh, disadvantaged group of women, and uh, we call attention to women's issue and promote solution. We do that by our advocacy work, our media work, interviews, uh, we do researches, we cooperate with our members, we do co-joint uh, projects, so there is a very big variety of our activities. We are members of European Women's Lobby, which is a, an umbrella organization um, uh, on, a, on a European level. Uh, and uh, we are part of that. And also we need to share value with this uh, network of women uh, around the Europe, which we see as a very important and also the cooperation between our country and other countries and uh, across the Europe. We see that that's the way how to strengthen women's rights. Uh, 
we defined our mission and uh, that is our mission is to take our on real problems of women face and uh, raise them to a political level and improve the situation of women in society so uh, that uh, that is our motto uh, and whenever we are ad do advocacy work we say that uh, we haven't made up those problems but we have facts and we have examples and we have real stories uh, that are actually a uh, problem in the society. And this is the uh, strongest arguments for politicians uh, to actually do something about it. And it's not very easy, as you know yourself, because when you approach men with women's problems, they do not always actually have the same experience. So for example, when we were advocating for uh, childcare, uh, they would be delegating me to their uh, wives who are at home with kids, and he has no idea how the childcare is uh, uh, working so uh, it's very uh, difficult to actually uh, lobby for some issues when men do not have the same experience as we do. Our uh, main goals that's a, a very wide range of issues and topics as I said uh, we do the advocacy mainly together and for our members so uh, who we represent those and also uh, I could uh, say that right now the main goals are gender pay gap which is one of the highest in the Czech Republic 22 percent uh, work-life balance um, which is a also it's linked to gender pay gap because women since the 90s actually after the revolution uh, the revolution uh, in women's rights uh, if i say so was to keep women at home with kids solve the unemployment in 90s and since then women think that to stay with kids for three years uh, at home uh, when they little is the privilege but in the end it causes uh, the feminization of poverty uh, and, and the gender pay gap so uh, we need also to work uh, together with women who actually now don't have many privileges and uh, they think that it's good to stay at home with kids, but also we need as women to think about a period of time after uh, uh, kids uh, become older and, and then is the biggest dis uh, discrimination of women on the labor bar market. And it goes all the way to the um, elderly, age when uh, as we have a great gender pay gap we have a big pension gap but it's uh, interesting that, that uh, compared to other countries it's not as big as the gender pay gap uh, we focus on marginalized group of women uh, right now we have a project in partnership with our members uh, and we focus on Roma immigrant women because uh, all these issues that are considered uh, being a discrimination of women when you are a member of uh, some vulnerable group, you always face these issues and discriminations even more. So we we'll want to uh, raise awareness uh, and help actually this uh, group of women to get more self-confidence uh, and uh, to be seen more in the public space and the issues uh, they represent too. Also, a um, big problem in the Czech Republic, violence against women. We see that and we've been uh, working on a campaign, Voice, Voice Against Violence, uh, for uh, several years. Uh, together with Amnesty International, and we want to bring this issue also into the public space, and uh, we've been doing so, and I could see the changes after five years that this is an issue that's been uh, spoken of recently more and more, uh, but we need more. Uh, somebody says that the legislation is okay, but it's never perfect, and also we need the implementation of the um, of the services and of, of the legislation because actually something different is law and, and the practice. So uh, there is still big taboo about speaking, about being uh, the, the, um, being the victim of violence. So women are not reaching for help and also there is uh, not enough specialized services uh, giving help to women uh, in the Czech Republic. 
Also uh, a big issue in the Czech Republic because we have uh, about 10 members organizations are working in obstetrics as a midwives and they would like for the Czech Republic to be able uh, to provide help at home to women who decide so it's not possible right now in the Czech Republic so also there are uh, practices in hospitals that women are not undertaking uh, freely so there uh, is this initiative uh, that uh, the child, uh, the, the care in the obstetrics should be different. Uh, more, for example, like in, in Great Britain or Germany, which are which is a neighboring country, and and there you can get a more variety of of care in obstetrics. Not not so in the Czech Republic. Uh, and a little bit different issue, but actually connected to abstracts are forced sterilizations that happened to women mainly in the communist time, but also in the 90s. And those women, when given birth, uh, were forcedly sterilized and never could have kids again. And uh, we would like the state to uh, pay for this uh, lack in their life and, and this damage uh, that has been made. And we very close to this. Um, uh, um, like uh, giving them the uh, the the financial uh, support. Uh, it's right now in the parliament and we've been uh, pushing for it because many women already died before actually they got any satisfaction in this um, suit. And uh, last but not least, and while you've been talking about it a lot, uh, it's a great issue for uh, women being part of the politics and decision making in the Czech Republic, we are not doing so well about 20% uh, for the last 10 years in the parliament, in the Senate. So, uh, and, and in a, a decision making positions uh, in the companies, it's not even so. So we've still got a lot to do. Unfortunately, the quotas didn't pass, so we need to find ways how to more um, push women um, and uh, for the elections and uh, for them to be elected. And uh, at the end, I just picked up some of our achievements uh, in the last uh, five years. Um, in 2016, we were um, behind the signature of the uh, Istanbul Convention that we were actually having a petition and, and it was signed at that time, unfortunately, not for the ratification that's been blocked uh, this year. Um, we've been uh, serving or our chair has been serving as a vice chair of the government of council for equal opportunities for women and men. Uh, we've been working on contribution uh, to kindergarten accessibility and the capacity increase in the Czech Republic. We've been cooperating um, on the creation of strategy for equality and, and other strategies to, to, uh, so to make sure that gender equality is part of the main strategies in the Czech Republic. Uh, uh, we've been contributing uh, by our work and the research uh, for the gender mainstreaming in the EU funding for the next uh, period of time when the EU money come. So every uh, grantee will have to actually uh, say and, and do something for gender equality. And we've been uh, working on um, monitoring of the fulfillment of women's rights in the international treaties and reporting on the matter of UN meetings. That's about it in this short time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Like um, really like a lot of inspirations and uh, we are so close to each other like laboring country, but at the same time, like uh, I'm also like very inspired and, and really like um, uh, by your example. And now I would like to invite uh, Laure Stenazi from uh, the Czech Women Forum. Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I understand time of, is of the essence. Tell me yeah, very openly how much time I have left, Anna, and I adjust. You know, there's one of women's capability. We adjust to everything, so I can do it. Of course. Tell me. Course. We have 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, that's plenty of time. Okay, so tell me when you can see my screen in a proper format. Yeah, it is. Okay, thank you. 
So thank you very much uh, for uh, giving a voice. Uh, and I think a voice and, and face, uh, basically visibility and representation is what women need, I think, uh, globally uh, on, that, on that platform today. Uh, on, I'm, uh, I'm a member of the Czech Women Forum, and that's uh, on its behalf that I will, I will share with you uh, today some uh, information about who we are, what we do, and maybe offer some food for thoughts and future collaboration, because I hope this meeting, which is, I feel actually both energized and completely exhausted. I've taken so much notes, you know, um, so I hope this is only one of the many that will follow because I feel there's a lot of follow up to do from all the great inspirations that I've heard until now. So this is the agenda. Uh, it all declines around the, the themes of women, as you can see. So um, I would like to take you to who we are, but also we like to define ourselves by whom we are not. Uh, what is our vision in a nutshell? Uh, maybe do a little, uh, you know, uh, assessment whether the mission that we're heading for is really accomplished. Uh, and then uh, maybe uh, go through the initiative, uh, the to be elected or to be neglected, that is the, that is really our, our core uh, initiative. And actually it bound very nicely with the last bullet point of uh, uh, my colleague Hannah, wherein she mentioned the woman in politics and the decision making. So who we are? Well, it was established in 1995 as a civic association. It's really women living, well, I guess Prague and the suburbs. Okay, let's not be uh, limiting in this. Uh, of very different uh, age and life uh, experiences, beliefs, educations or roots. Uh, I'm actually the only foreigner at the forum. I've been living in the Czech Republic for 20 years. I joined the forum only five years ago, but I'm originally, I'm actually half Spanish, half French. Uh, we all have different uh, professions and we are all of different sensitivities, political, social, cultural background, okay? But what is uniting us is we have a passion for what uh, women rights and women as a topic is, and we have a common vision on gender equality and any endeavor to actually achieve it, okay? Whom we are not is, uh, and this is something I feel quite strong about, maybe it's a cultural difference, maybe even uh, I get into discussion when I discuss it with my Czech or Slovak uh, counterparts. Uh, I don't see myself as a feminist because I wouldn't know how to define what feminism really is. Uh, nevertheless, we are in no way enemies of the male population. And I think we, we really love or uh, the men around us that are close to our hearts. And I think they are a fully integral part of the, our balance in life. But we just want to speak with our own voice and don't be uh, taken for granted that we will follow whatever has been said on our behalf. So the vision of the Women Forum is as follow. So uh, it's named Forum Gen in Czech, and it basically, it's an empowerment tool. So it really empowers women in key areas of the society, be it political, economical, and social, for really experience sharing and networking. I want to say this is a lot, and this is also a little, because this is really the only thing that we're promoting. As you can see from the previous slide, we are not like, this is not our full-time profession. I could even say that we are kind of amateurs in the matter. What reunites us is the passion for the topic. But we believe strongly that by sharing experience and networking, because I think it's a, it's a skill set also networking that men, unfortunately, do maybe much better to their own benefits than women can, um, to really encourage women to mingle and, and use their full potential. Also, also maybe gain a little bit of self-confidence that we might on some occasions be lacking of, okay? So it is really structured around uh, organizing, accompanying, nurturing like a debate or non-political discussion. So that as a way to map really all the developments of the legislative reforms when it relates to the women's right, to the, to the status of the woman in the Czech Republic, 
and uh, our intent is also to report that information and whenever it's possible like today we have such an opportunity with this forum is really contributes not only to the member of the association but to other association across Europe um, but also in the media and the state administration authorities wherever relevant so if you remember the slide number two from uh, from Hannah uh, we are really a small piece of a huge puzzle we all realize that, but we also believe that uh, every little helps. And we're actually one of the little icons on that big slide that Hannah was sharing for us. So, so, so the women's lobby is, interesting, is important for us because it's really an umbrella that keeps us united in our mission. Okay. So uh, our aim is to support any activities of, of women and men, that's important. Uh, I don't think we have any gentlemen to the on the call, so I did not read them actually at the beginning, but um, but that help leveraging any woman potential in the society. So uh, in terms of concrete projects that we support, uh, we support any project that will promote solidarity among women that would help at boosting their self-confidence. But in particular, we have that purpose of enhancing participation like political participation and representation at the political woman, um, at, the, at the particular level of women in the society. Mission accomplished, you can notice that there is a big question mark. Uh, I don't know if it will ever disappear, this question mark, but maybe this is, you know, the, the fun is, you know, that's the way how to get there that makes the fun. Maybe this is not the outcome. Uh, it's a it's a long term long term process. I've heard it from all the speakers uh, before me. It's been very inspiring. I've heard you know uh, breaking the glass ceilings. Uh, I mean, I was amazed when I saw the number of 43 percent of you know women represented at the political level. Um, I mean, we we are not there in the Czech Republic. Okay, the the glass it's a glass that is really resistant. It's really ugly, bulletproof, resistant glass because it doesn't break that easily, obviously. Um, so in polit when political representation is concerned, we are still at the 80-20 representation. So actually, when you look at the polls, you will see that there are 30% of women's name, let's say, on the list that will be potentially elected. Nevertheless, less than half of that 30% make it through. Okay, and the reasons for that is that there are a lot of prejudices still in the society that prevails and that somehow we've not been able to kind of, you know, kind of eliminate over the last, I would say, since the revolution and like the democratic system was put in place in the Czech Republic. So uh, here I put a quote. It's a quote from Voltaire from the 17th century. You can see things have not changed much since. So basically, um, when you look at the, at the trends and at the behaviors during election, men tend to trust men, which one could ex uh, kind of expect. But the saddest uh, information is that, uh, and it's a fact, is that women also tend to distrust or mistrust women in election. So what we've been realizing is that women do not vote for women. Okay, so there is like this kind of, I don't know if it's a competition instinct or, but th there is a lack of credibility there that somehow has not, has not yet disappeared. Okay, so the sol solidarity among women remains with a big question mark uh, on the political scene in the Czech Republic, but I dare to say this is not uh, probably a Czech, you know, isolated, isolated case. So the mission is clear for us. Has it been accomplished? I would say not yet. And what do we need basically to accompany us on, on the way? That is really, we need to be empowered ourselves as a civic organization, but I would say all the organization that participate toward the same goal to be able to support others. And this is where, um, you know, any sharing of insights, any research or uh, results in the field of gender studies can be used and leveraged for advantage. Uh, that's why, you know, an opportunity like today, getting feedback, getting new ideas, all of those are really enablers to inspire and to sharpen our project principles in the future. 
psychological support, I think, is a great, great uh, positive factor. I think psychological support is really someone, something that women uh, master, all the men, maybe because we speak about how we feel maybe more easily. Um, so let's use it to our advantage as well. Let's support each other and, and unite in the cause. And also, uh, we need to have some kind of willingness to engage in some fruitful cooperation. We need to work together. Um, I think from that perspective, COVID has not brought only, I would say, negative outcomes, because I think people have learned a new way to mediate, a new way to meet, even if it's only virtually. And we have like tons of possibilities to actually exchange on those digital platforms where maybe in the past we're more limiting ourselves, you know, meeting the people in person, traveling and so on. So this is something that probably we see as an opportunity as well. So here, uh, to make it short, I will conclude on that. That's a very uh, important project that um, sadly has been contemporary, I would say, or actual for quite some years. We are not there yet, but that was one of the biggest initiatives. Uh, it was uh, branded under the name be elected or be neglected. As you can see uh, in the verb itself, it's only two letters difference but it makes a hell of a difference. And basically it was meant to really promote equal participation of women in national politics. The inspiration for that, uh, for that initiative really come from uh, the United States where they had established a, a women's college of management. So basically it was a network of over 200 universities that got together and they've been able to put together a program that was able to welcome over 300 students and prepare those women. I would say age-wise, it was a wide range of 25 plus until almost 50 uh, and really prepare those women for high political functions. So just to make sure that women are actually represented, they are actually have a face and a voice in the political world because we would like to move the debate from there, there when we talk about women rights, you, you we talk a lot about you know opportunities, we talk about uh, even sometimes problems, where we would like to see that we move from being part of the problem because okay, women representation, okay, well, gender gap, okay, well, uh, pay equal pay is not is not rich. So all of these are kind of, you know, obstacles on the way, and we'd like to move from being part of the problem to actually becoming part of the solution. And we believe that if we are represented uh, at election and we have a voice on the political scene, then we will tend to maybe defend better interests of women for women. And I've heard that from the other participants and speakers a bit earlier, because I truly believe that we can do a good job. We just have to accept that we will do it differently than men would, okay? So this is still actual. This is something that has been taken quite uh, to the highest sphere of politics. Unfortunately, there were already like working groups and workshops that were constituted, but we never really got to that ultimate goal to have really a university for women, so to say, so that they are prepared to, to take position in high political function. This is maybe a dream, but this is a vision that we still have and something that we still want to pursue. So if that resonates today with any one of the organizations that are represented, we are more than happy you know, to, to, to continue on that thought and, and keep working together. Um, I just wanted to make a reminder because I promised this to uh, Mrs. Uh, Maria Marvanova, who was the the, the wonderful lady uh, founder of the of the of the Women uh, Forum. She's over 80 years old today. Uh, she has delegated me. I feel honored, uh, the pleasure to speak to you today. Uh, but she's absolutely admirable. You know, she's she's in essence really kind of the demonstration of what women should fight for on that Czech political scene. She had very high you know, public function at a time where it, she was almost the only one. So she's been extremely brave. And this is the desatero that she spent a lot of time putting together. So I wanted to share it with you guys. I think Anna will make the documents available. We don't have to read the material from uh, point one to 10. But I think this resonates a lot with what I've heard until now, that really we need to have self-confidence. 
uh, we do things equally good, but we do it differently and we have to recognize that difference. Uh, it's okay to criticize women, but we should not criticize more than we criticize uh, the male population. Uh, the cooperation being a key and, uh, and the solidarity where we truly believe that in unity that uh, we will find a victory. So that's all from my side. I can take any question if we still have time for that or if any. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we don't have questions, but uh, uh, we don't good. have time for uh, <laughs> we, don't, we probably will have a lot of questions, but we don't have time for them. But it was like extremely packed for two hours, but uh, like a lot of inspirations. And thank you very much for each of you. Like it was like really a pleasure to listen to you and uh, I would be so happy to share uh, the video with other like Polish uh, organizations, especially uh, Polish organizations fighting for women's rights. We really need the solidarity now in Poland. So thank you for your time, your efforts, your knowledge, your experience. Like, uh, and um, hopefully we'll uh, meet in the future in Poland and we can share with you what we achieved thanks to your inspirations also so um have a nice afternoon thank you for being with us um of course write me if you uh, need anything also like when it comes to um uh, finding foreign partners or inspiration and uh, yeah and and i i i feel that i don't know um uh, about you but i feel the power of women's solidarity uh, both borders and uh, like this international solidarity that was mentioned many times uh, today. So thank you very much and uh, have a, a wonderful uh, afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for being thank with you. us to all participants from Poland, Romania. Uh, I hope it was as well for you, like a really nice time, full of knowledge and inspirations. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 All the best in your and also like fingers crossed for um, for your efforts in your countries, even though they are already uh, <laughs> quite uh, have like but as we can see level, even in Iceland uh, there is still like um, a, lot a lot of things to do. Thank you very much.